want to wish everybody well, Boker Tov, uh, or Tzoraim Tov, Erev Tov in Israel. I want to, on, on Motzei Yom Kippur, and uh, should be a, a, a wonderful year uh, for personally, for people, for families, for the Jewish people, and of course, for the world at large. And uh, should have a, a year of, of good health. Welcome to part two of um, the series 929 and Tor on the Sefer Tehillim with Dr. Benny, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you back. So um, two, uh, two of 30, and we look forward to learning uh, through to April, and uh, uh, thank you very much. It's a wonderful thing to do really on the day after Yom Kippur. So Vakashah, Dr. Benny, take it away. Thank you, Rabbi Jay. Shalom Aleichem, everybody. It's a pleasure to present here at the second lecture of our 30 lecture series, looking at the entire book as an entity. What I would like to focus on today is to look at the structure of book one, and that will be discussed in the next lecture. So I will touch it a little bit, and I would like to focus today on Tehillim 8, Chet. And I would like to use it as a template, as an example, how to look at the text. We will read the text together, Beautiful, beautiful Mizmor, for sure one of the most beautiful 150 Mizmorim that we have in Sefer Tehilim. It is a wonderful structure and the message. When we look at the text, I would like to point out that there are some questions, open questions, which I don't think we can find a good explanation if we look only at the text. I would like to use that as really as an example to show a text without the context is missing something. And I want to prove you that without looking at the context, we will not fully understand the text. The text is not Mismo Chet, the eighth chapter. The text is the, en the entity, the adjacent Mismorim as well. And I want to prove that to you that if we compare some expressions which causes some difficulties to understand. They are really difficult because the Tanakh wants us to take a look at the source. Where else do these expressions appear? So the difficulties will actually guide us to come to the right place. That will help us to understand Mizmor Chet, the eighth chapter, as part of the unit 314. No chance that we can look today at all the 12 chapters. But I want to open the horizons from chapter eight to the neighbor, to all the neighbors, and to give you a little bit of a taste how to read the entire unit as a story, as a narrative. And that will help us to understand what is the first unit talking about. Before I start the lecture, I would like to relate to uh, one comment I, uh, I would like to thank. I wish to thank for the comments both in chat and some uh, comments per email which I got. And I take these comments very serious. And I would like to have today as an introductory note, the question, how much should I bring in English and how much in Hebrew? And that is a complex question. First of all, uh, Hebrew is much easier for me but uh, that's of course not the real reason. And because English might, is much easier for some of you. And I would like to address this question very seriously. There is a beautiful uh, quote in the Talmud, Yerushalmi, where it says that Kriyat Shema, you should read according to Rebbe, the author of the Mishnah, only in Hebrew. We don't translate it. Yes, some people don't understand it, so please learn to understand it, to translate it. And the reason, what is the reason for that? These words should be for you on your heart. So the Talmud wants to read, these words of the Torah, they can only be the way they are in Hebrew. And that is an interesting statement, of course, only in the Talmud of Yerushalayim, because there they spoke Hebrew. We don't find this drasha in the uh, Bavli. What is the reason for that? I want to show you in these lectures that there is an outstanding beauty of the Hebrew language. And there are a lot of details we will never recognize and for sure not enjoy 
if we read it in a translation. My first language is not Hebrew, so I'm aware of the difficulties to learn the language, to understand the language, and to develop a sensitivity of all beautiful finesses. So I would like to, based on the comments that everything has to be translated, I respect that and I'm aware that otherwise I cannot teach, but I still want to encourage you, try to understand Lashona Kodesh. And I would like to offer, I'm trying to do my best with the outstanding help of uh, Susan Suna and Audrey Samuels who assist me with that. And I hope we will all come to a certain comfort zone if we do a compromise that on one hand there will be translations, but never forget the beauty can only be learned in Hebrew. And I think today that the language of King David after 2000 years, the language of the Bible is uh, experienced a revival. So Alachat Kama Vakama, there is a good reason to do so. For those who are interested, there is a beautiful paper by Dr. Fedelbush, Sharaf Fedelbush, Makom Haivrit Betalmud, the only uh, uh, detail I have to mention, but I didn't find the translation of this, uh, of the paper, but worthwhile, who can read it, to look at that. Here we have slide number three. And before we go into the details, I will, I will enlarge it very soon. I want to point out a very important aspect um, related to this slide. That is a template. On this slide, I try to show in the right upper quarter the text of Tehillim. And we will read it in a moment. We will read the text. That is the original te text. I did not touch it, not with colors, and will not. I didn't go with my arrows into the text. Let the text be a text the way it is. Afterwards, on the left side, I have comment. Uh, I have a few uh, explanations and comments on the text, the division of the mismo, and internal alliterations, which are extremely important and a very important key to start the analysis. In red. I do have in the right lower corner, the context. How is this mismo related to other mismorim? And normally if we talk about interpretation of the Bible, it says, how do we interpret the Bible? And I would like to give it another meaning. Parshanut mikra, not the way we interpret the Bible, but rather how does the Bible interpret the text? Because if we look at the context, it's like a commentary on the text. That's a very, very, I think, a very clever approach by the, uh, in, by, the uh, but by the approach of the contextual interpretation that we learn and we have commentaries from other chapters how to understand this mismo. And on the left lower side, we have the intertextuality from other sources. So let's read for now on this, uh, the template, which I would like to use for the lectures. I try to take one mismo and to explain it, sometimes two, and go from there to the neighbors of this mismo in order to get a better understanding. I start with uh, reading the text. But I just lost Safari, just a moment. Apologies. Here we go. And we go to, to um, Tehillim chapter 8, which I will, I'm going to read for you in Hebrew. No, I don't know how it works now. Oh, here we are. So I read the text in Hebrew. And you can, instead that I translate it, you see the text here translated. להשבית אויב ומתנקם. כי אראה שמך מעשה אצבעותיך, 
ירח וכוכבים אשר כוננת, מה אנוש כי תזכרנו, ובן אדם כי תפקדנו. ותחסרהו מעט מאלוהים, וכבוד והדר תעתרהו, תמשילהו ומעשה ידיך, כל שעתה תחת רגליו. צונא ואלפים כולם, וגם בהמות שדי, ציפור שמיים ודגי הים, עובר אורחות ימים. אדוני אדוננו, מאדיר שמך בכל הארץ. Here we have this chapter, and I would like to point out a few questions before we come to the text. Would we be a smaller group? We can start the discussions, questions, comments, thoughts. That is not possible in this uh, larger forum. So let me raise that for you. Let me raise a few comments on that. First of all, we have an, an opening question of Ma Adil Shimcha Bechol Haaretz. And this Ma Adil Shimcha Bechol Haaretz is both in, in the second and in the tenth verse the beginning and the end of the Mizmor. It's the opening and the end. In Latin, it's called inclusio, an inclusion, which is a technique, a frame, a framework for the entire Mizmor. At the beginning, it says, Hashem Adoneinu ma'adir shimcha b'chol ha'aretz. How majestic is your, uh, is your name throughout the, the entire earth? But you have uh, you have covered the heavens with your splendor. Asher tnahotcha b'shamayim is mentioned only at the beginning and not at the end. Therefore, I put here uh, a, a sign, it's empty. Why is it there no splendor of the heaven? If it's at the beginning, why not at the end? If it's not at the end, why should it be at the, at the beginning? That is a very interesting question and a very meaningful question. Because what the Mizmor actually does, it takes the greatness, the beauty of God on the earth, which is, yes, it starts there in heaven, but it brings it down to earth. At the end, nothing is mentioned how beautiful the splendor is in heaven. The, the only beauty mentioned in the bottom line of the Mizmor is, how beautiful is, uh, is your name God on earth, not in heaven. That is the motion, that is the dynamic of this mizmor. There is a movement. God is great in heaven, and if I see your heaven, number four, verse four, kir eresh amecha, mase etzbotecha, yareach vekochavim asher konanta. I see the sky, I see the moon, I see the stars. What is the next question? What is beautiful about heaven? Ma enosh kitizkerena. What I see actually from this enthusiastic view of the sky of the universe, the real question comes in verse five, ma enosh ki tizkarena. What's about human existence? The, uh, the, the role of a human being. And Redak, Rabbi David Kimchi points that out. And he says, ma enosh hu hefech ma adir shimcha. Ki hu lehagdala, what is man is the opposite of how great is your name. What I mentioned at the beginning, how difficult it is to translate, I was not able to translate that properly. In Hebrew, it's the same word, ma, how great is your name, Hashem, and ma enosh, what is man? Because the latter is for greatness of Hashem, and the former is for the minimization of, human, of the human being. That is exactly the movement, the dynamic of this mismo. You are great, you are amazing. And at the end, you are down. You want us, Hashem, the human being, to do something down on earth. So that is common regarding the inclusion of this mismo. Let's now take a look at another comment, which is, oh, uh, sorry, which is the verse from Ma Enosh till uh, verse 9. There is a beautiful dynamic. What do you think about you? Why do you respect human being? We are not worth. But it says in, six, uh, in verse six, but you gave us a lot of honor. You gave us a lot of splendor to a human being. 
Tamshilehu b'maaseh adecha. Everything is under his legs. Animals, animals who are at home and those on the field and birds and fish and crossing the, the seas. There is a dynamic. It's not only the human being, it's his environment. It's nature surrounding his domain and it's like growing in waves, it's getting bigger. I tried to do that with PowerPoint. I'm not sure if, it is, if you think it's successful, but let's give it a trial here. And afterwards, I want to look at two expressions. We'll come back to that in a moment. So let's take a look here. These are the opening verses. It says, We look at the sky. And afterwards, we think, oh, where is the human being? Where, what is my role? What's my function? What's my destination in life in the universe? So that is a very personal philosophical question. What is my role? What is my place here? So the first thing we talk about is these are the animals, the domestic animals. Also those on the field, not only uh, surrounding in my home, but also the birds which are up high and also the gay hayam, the fishes of the sea, over or hot yamim, which brings me to other places. You see a beautiful dynamic in the description of, uh, of um, uh, verse seven to nine, it's growing. That is exactly the, the, the empowerment of a human being that, he, that God gives him a lot, a very, very significant role. If we go back, to this inclusion, we understand very well. Hashem wants a human being, despite that his role is limited, he wants him to take responsibility. He wants him to be aware he is the keeper of the world and he is like God, he is a representative of Hashem on earth. A very powerful message of this mismo. Now we understand that the beginning, your name is great on all of the, uh, uh, on earth and your splendor is in the heaven. But at the end, it says, no, you are great on earth. We don't care about the heaven. We want the human being to be active and to be responsible on earth. So the bottom line of this mismo is that the bottom line of is missing. We want to be on earth, not, on, not in the heaven. Uh, for these shiurim, I want to focus on Tehillim, but there is a wonderful Midrash, which I cannot not mention. I cannot explain it in much detail, but I want to tell you about this, this beautiful Midrash. You have it in the PowerPoint presentation, which is online, and I have it here also in English. A wonderful Midrash. It describes when Moshe Rabbeinu came to heaven, here you have it in English, when he came to heaven, uh, the angels were asking him, were asking HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what is man that you consider and the son of man that you think of him? That's exactly what it says in Tehillim 8. Because your name is throughout the earth, but the majesty is above the heavens. Asher tnahotcha ala shamayim. So Moshe had to argue with Hashem. And Moshe said, I cannot argue with the angels. So Hashem told Moshe, Please, please hold my kiseha kavod, hold my throne, Moshe, and give them an answer. Moshe, uh, uh, Hashem says, Moshe, don't be afraid from the angels in heaven. Moshe, you as a human being, give them an answer. Don't be afraid. And he started to explain, he starts to have an argument with the angels. And he tells them, you know what is written in the Torah? In the Torah, it's written, you should rest Shabbat, you, you, you should respect the parents. Did you have, said Moshe to the angels, do you work all the week? Do you have parents? Do you have a Isur of Lot Yitzach? Are these relevant? Whatever is written in the Torah is for human beings. And all of a sudden, all the angels answered him, Miyad Hodulo Bochu. They immediately thanked the Hashem and they said, God, our Lord, how great is your name through the land. While spread your majesty over the heavens was not written at the end of the Mizmor. 
So immediately, all the angels loved Moshe and told him, you get a reward that they called you men, you got it as a gift, the Torah. That is a wonderful Midrash, saying, Bishar shekarucha adam lakachta matanot. This very colorful Midrash says exactly what I want to show here. It says, sorry, it says what I wanted to show here. Man has power, man has responsibility. And if he takes all his responsibility, he can argue with the heaven. And he can tell the heaven whatever the, the angels are in the heaven. Of course, an idea of the Midrash, he can tell them, no, I down, down to earth, a human being has to fulfill his role. I have to make a change down here, down on earth. Whatever is in heaven is not relevant for me. What is relevant is down on earth. Therefore, the deletion of the, of the words, Asher shamaim, is extremely meaningful. I do not only explain, I try not only to explain what is written, in this case, I'm trying to explain what is missing. And these missing words at the end are the bottom line of the mismo, not in heaven, down to earth. Now here, I want to continue with, this, with the analysis of the, of the mismo. And we have here one verse, uh, Gimel, Mipi Olelim Veyonkim Yisadeta Oz. From the mouth of infants and little children, sucklings, Yonik, you have founded strength. And if we look at the universe, the sun, the heaven, the moon, and the stars, there are mountains. There are many, many other beautiful things. Why is the Mismo talking about the children? Why are the children, the infants, so important? I checked that in the commentators, Mikhaot Gdolot in the Midrash, and here I do think these, the concept of Mipi Olalim Veyonkim to be pointed out very uh, specifically here, and there the foundation of God's power, Yisad Taoz, that is not an easy sentence. It looks to me to be a little bit a foreign body or strange to the flow, to the atmosphere of this mismo. Why are the children playing such an important role as a beginning point? Your greatness is on earth, on heaven, and children and babies are the most important one. And afterwards we look at the sky. I think here we have an outstanding example for intertextuality. Let's search, where do we know the concept, the, 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 the term, olel veyonek, uh, infants and babies. And we see that in Yirmiyahu it's mentioned, in Yoel, it's mentioned in Eicha, in the laments on the Churban Habayit. And there it says, terrible descriptions, that children were killed, babies were killed. Why? Levilti hotir lahem sherit. Nobody, the Jewish people, will not survive as a punishment at the time of Yirmiyahu. And the same is true for Yoel and Eicha. Children and babies were hungry and they died. And that was the end. If our Mismo says the world is beautiful, the world has a future, the world has a role for human being, for mankind, yes, the concept of children is the most important one. They are not just one little detail like the fish and the birds and other animals which are part of the universe on the creation. They are the future of human history, the future of our planet. That is the message why our Mismo mentioned those in particular. And they are Yisad Taoz. If we look intertextual, where else in the Bible uh, does the Bible talk about Olelim the Yom Kim? about babies and infants, where they are destroyed, Churban Habayit, at the destruction of the first temple. Terrible, terrible de descriptions, how they were killed, how they died in hunger, and other situations. They are, you sought the foundation of God's power. And I used here a few pictures from the Holocaust. Children were killed, because killing them is exactly the destruction of the world. The, dis the destruction of the next generation. 
if they survive, if they are destroyed, that is what we have in Eicha and Yirmiyahu. If our Mizmor says, how beautiful, you have children, you have babies, you have the next generation growing. That is exactly the beauty of the future generation, the future of mankind. That is the message here. And I want to prove that with another example in this Mizmor. It is the next part of the same uh, verse 3. Leman sorerecha lehashbit oyev umitnakem. You created babies and infants, which are the foundation of your power, Hashem. Why? Because of your adversaries, so that you may st uh, still the enemy and avenger. If you have children, they will fight your enemies and they will still them, they will calm them down, they will uh, neutralize all your enemies. How does that fit to this beautiful mismo talking about creation? That is really a foreign body. This mismo is not talking about war. The mismo is not talking about enemies and suffering and oyevu uh, mitnakem. It's the beauty of the creation. So why always to mix that in? And here, I think the text is not clear. The text requests an explanation. Where do we have the explanation from? We have the explanation for the text from the context. And please, let's take a look at other Mizmorim from 3 to 14. In this case, only 3, 4, 6, 7, and chapter 9, 10, and 13. The, the word Tzorerecha, your enemies, is mentioned there. And in all these other Mizmorim, we have a complaint. The psalmist complains, I have a lot of enemies. I am in a big tsarot. Tsar means I, I'm in a tsara. Tsar means narrow. Mitzrayim is a narrow land because it's all along the river. If I have tsarot, I'm like narrow like that, no way out. Tsorerai are only, are, are those people who put me in trouble. My enemies, they put me like that. So the word tsarai, tsar, tsorerai, tsoreri, tsorerai is mentioned in chapter three, four, six, and seven, five times. And afterwards, I'm in the time of tsarot, leitot batsara, kol tsorerav, tsarai yagilu, ki emot, my enemies will be happy if, I, if, I'm, if I'm killed. So this psalmist of chapter 8, he is surrounded by enemies and he is threatened by enemies. His life is in danger. His future is in danger. If he says in chapter 8, please give me children and give me infants because that is the foundation of my power, he says that's the only way I will survive that I build the next generation. And the beauty of the nature and the beauty of the universe, chapter eight is, that I have the possibility to continue the nature, that I have to, uh, the, the schut, the privilege, to build the next generation. If that's not the case, my enemies will overcome me. Where do we talk about enemies? In the context. The context is full of enemies. What is the mismor doing? The mismor says, living in this terrible environment of pain, of enemies, of danger, of life-threatening situations, I have only one thing that keeps me alive. It's the hope and the belief your world is just wonderful and your world on heaven and on earth is great. And I, as a human being, I have to play a role. I'm allowed to play a role. I'm entitled by a Kedush to play the role that I have to improve the world. And if I do so, I will overcome everything that the tzorim, the enemies, want to destroy. So that is an amazing example. We don't understand uh, in chapter eight, the third verse, without looking at the context and the intertext. And here I want to point out, we mentioned at the introductory note, the beauty of the Hebrew language. And that's just amazing. In all the 10 times where the word tsarai, tsorerai is mentioned, all of them, it always, the, the psalmist talks about 
his enemies, his problems, the people who threaten his life. Batsar li, tsarai, tsorerai, tsoreri, tsorerai. Always about his problem. But in chapter 8, if he talks about the beautiful nature of God and God who is in heaven and on earth, it's the only time when he, men when he mentions the word tsorer, but he says, these are not my enemy, Hashem. These are your enemies. Because those who are my enemies in all the surrounding chapters, yes, they kill me and they threaten my life. But if I, look at the, if I look at nature, at the universe, if I look at the beautiful creation of Hashem, and I look at the Creator, they are the enemies of God's creation. They are your enemies. So only here it says, Tzorerecha. They are your enemies. And therefore, I point that out as a wonderful example that we understand the notion of Tzorerecha only if we look at the, all the adjacent chapters from 3 to 14, which are a unit, as I will try to explain you soon in the next minutes. The notion of Oyev Umitnakem, uh, enemy and avenger, is mentioned only twice in Sefer Tehilim. The second time is in chapter 44, in Mizmor 44. And there is a terrible description about the suffering at the, uh, at the time of uh, Tehilim, Mikol Mecharef Fumegadef Mipnei Oyef Umitnakem, a terrible lament, a, a, a kina, how bad it is and how terribly he suffers. So, of course, the background of chapter 8 is the suffering. But he makes all his efforts to say, no, I'm not suffering. I'm look at your beautiful creation and I just want one thing, Hashem. Your creation should not be destroyed by your enemies because my enemies are your enemies and what I care about is about your creation. That is a summary now of to look at the chapter, at the Mismo as an entity beginning at the end and to look at the Mismo, these details that the man is empowered, the human being is empowered to play an active role and to make sure it should not be destroyed. I mentioned that we have to look at the surrounding chapters. And that is a huge, huge challenge. It's a huge challenge because we need for that to understand the unit of chapter 3 to chapter 14, 12 Mizmorim. What we should do is to take a look at 12 Mizmorim to see how they connect, what is the structure. And that's a lot of work, fascinating. I was told one, I should never bring more than one handout to a class. So I don't know if you can see it here. I prepared, hold on. I prepared this as a huge handout of two meters, what you see here. And you have here 12 Mizmorim with all the analogies from chapter three to chapter four, uh, 14. And if you read them, you can go through a whole narrative. It is beautiful. It is every chapter brings something new to it. There is no chance I can do that. Why can't I do that? Because time is running out. Because you have to learn 12 Mizmorim. And you have to remember 12 Mizmorim. And you have to take a look at all the 12 Mizmorim at the same time. It's impossible that you can read it here, the, the reading, the text, without losing the 12th chapter. Oh, if I enlarge it, you will not see everything together. So that is the big challenge, and that's the reason why the contextual interpretation was just missed. Now, I want to encourage you, if you are in 929, that you try to read chapter 3 to 14 in one, in one hour. Read it quickly and take a look at the terms and feel the narrative. What, is, what, is, what the flow says that in the middle of a world of evil and evildoers, from chapter 3 to 14, there is a, a, a enthusiasm about God's creation. And in the middle, he says, it can't be true that the world should be destroyed by the Rashaim, by the Oivim, by the Tzorim. That can't be true. The only thing that can be true is that God created the world and God gave me the power to make the world a better one. 
that is the, the center of the unit, not only as a literary unit, that is the center of this unit to say, I will not accept that Hashem, Hashem's creation should be destroyed. There is a counter, there is a response to that. We have to make the world a better one. So I can show you for now only one flow, a, a few examples from this beautiful, beautiful flow, which explains at the end, if I take all these pieces, these are only 12 chapters, we have 150, but we put them all together like a puzzle, you will see at the beginning we talk about it, there is a lot of risha, a lot of evil doers on the world, which endanger the world. And David says, no, never ever be a victim of the Resha. Try to make it better. That is the main and central message of this unit. Now let's take a look at that. And I want to give you a taste by looking at the three, at the two chapters next to chapter eight. There is chapter seven and chapter nine and 10. I take chapter 9 and 10 together for a very simple reason. Chapter 10 does not start with um, a heading. It doesn't say at the beginning, Mismole David. And there is a good reason for that. We cannot elaborate now chapter 9 and 10, but there is a beautiful detail which is worthwhile to look at. Chapter 9 and 10, there is no opening for chapter 10, but there is a continuous Aleph bit alphabetic acrosticum from Aleph to Kaf, which is broken. Lama Hashem ta'amod merachok. Why Hashem do you stand far away? And it continues the Aleph Bet, no Aleph Bet from Mem to Tzadi. It continues with Kuf Lamet, with Kuf Reshin Tav, the end of the alphabet. Why? Because there is an alphabet from Aleph to Tav. But here, what the psalmist describes, how beautiful the world is. But here he says, there are still a lot of enemies. I have a hard time to organize your, your universe. So what is he saying? He says, I found the order according to the Aleph Bet, but in the middle, I get broken. It breaks. So the Aleph Bet is broken in the middle. I want to show you now a masterpiece of biblical literature, a masterpiece. We discussed that we have in chapter 8 this frame, the inclusion. Adonai Adonainu ma'adir shimcha b'chol ha'aretz asher tna utcha l'ashamayim. And here we have Adonai Adonainu ma'adir shimcha b'chol ha'aretz. We mentioned the name of Hashem. Shimcha. What is the verse just before chapter 9, chapters uh, 8? The last word of chapter the last verse of chapter 7 says, uh, I will praise Hashem for his righteousness. And I will sing a, 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 a hymn to the name of the Lord Most High, Elion. He is talking about Hashem. He wants to sing about Hashem. He is, he is surrounded by Resha, by evildoers but he wants to help, he wants to thank and to sing. Right after this chapter, we have exactly the same word, not exactly, but the same expressions. I highlighted it here in colors. Of course, we have to read the Hebrew. Just before chapter 8, the last verse of chapter 7, and just after chapter 8, the first verse of chapter 9 is the same word. You see, Ode Hashem, Azamra, Shimcha, Elion, the five same words. That is a classical technique of the contextual interpretation. The same verse here and there. But please pay attention, it's not the same. What he is concerned about in chapter seven is, I want to see your justice, because I suffer. What he is concerned, beginning of chapter nine, is not his suffering. I'm excited, I will thank you with all my heart. He is a healthy guy, he is a happy guy. He is a guy with a big heart. I will tell all your wonders. He is going to talk about Niflaot. And he's telling about that to the entire world. Esmecha, 
I will rejoice on that. And I will and he will be exalting you. He is a happy guy. Why is he so happy in chapter nine? And why is he not happy in chapter seven? And please pay, pay attention. At the end of chapter seven, he talks about Hashem. Hashem Hashem Elyon Ketzitko in his righteousness. In chapter nine, he has a totally different attitude. He talks with all his heart, I will tell all your wonders. I will rejoice in you, singing your name. Where from did he know? Why did he change his attitude by talking in chapter 7 about Hashem to talk now in chapter 9 to Hashem and mention Shimcha, not Shem Hashem? Where did he learn the notion of Shimcha instead of Shem Hashem? The answer is very simple. Chapter 8 is an excited, enthusiastic song about Ma Adir Shimcha Bechol Haaretz. And if he talks about God's name and your name, so he changed his talking about the name of Hashem, Vazamra Shem Hashem Elyon in chapter 7, he changes in a very meaningful, significant, a very significant change. He talks directly to Hashem and he mentions Shimcha. So here we see chapter 8 in the middle, which is built symmetrically with the inclusion of chapter 8, has an envelope just beforehand and just afterwards with the same words, with a very significant change in his religious attitude. He is not complaining about the lack of justice and asking for justice, chapter 7 and all the chapters before. He is trying to make the world a better one, chapter 9, and afterwards. What a beauty! That is the story which I try to show you now in, uh, with this example. Now here, that is a slide. I think if I would go to a school and teach with such a slide and other teachers would come, how this young guy is teaching the first time, I would be fired. That would be my last lecture because such a slide is a killer. You cannot present that. Look how many words. Normally it says on the PowerPoint slide, three, maximum seven words. Look what I did to you here. So that is a reason to fire this guy. So I hope you will not fire me because that is the beauty. The beauty of this slide is what I try to do, to take chapter three to 14 and take all the words which are repeated over all the 12 chapters and which tell you a story, a biblical art. It's not only biblical art, it's a psychology. Take the same term and repeat it and repeat it and grow with that, a bibliotherapy. The world helps you to grow with the King David and to grow. I want to show that to you. I showed you this Azamra Shem Hashem and Azamra Shem Hashem Elyon here. And if you want, if you have time and the energy, it's worthwhile to print that out, to read the, the, the 12 chapters again, and trying to follow the words. I discussed the tsarai here, which you see here, and I want, and I discussed the oivim, which you see the oivim from the beginning, chapter eight, all the time he talks about the oivim. But now I show you something beautiful, and I didn't enlarge it for a special uh, slide, because I think that's the best way to see it, but of course, the easiest way to remember all the Mizmorim is just to learn them by heart and afterwards it's easy to remember them. That's of course very hard to do and that is the big obstacle to understand old Sefer Tehilim as a unit because we don't know, we don't really know it. And if we know it by heart, oh, a little bit of Psukei de Zimra, Ktsat Kabbalat Shabbat, and a little bit there and a little bit here from the Sidur. We don't look at the Sefer Tehilim. We look at the quoted Mizmorim in the Sidur, and they are almost never or very rarely presented as a narrative from the beginning to the end. Look now the beauty of the word God in chapter 8 gave the human being kavod. What's the background of the word kavod? There is a background to the word kavod. In chapter 3, 4, 7 it says, the psalmist, the psalmist says, God, these enemies are terrible. 
They took away all my kavod. They kill me. My kavod is gone. Please help me. He says, Vata Adonai magen ba'adi kvodi umerim roshi b'nei ish adma kvodi lechlima uchvodi le'afar yishko. He suffers because there is a violation of his kavod. There is a destruction of his kavod. Human dignity is gone by the enemies. And what does he say in chapter 8? God, you gave me, when you created me, a lot of kavod. Let's keep the human dignity. Let's stay an image of God. We had in chapter 8, in verse 5, uh, the verse... What is man that you have been mindful of him? A mortal man, Enosh, that you have taken note of him. The Mizmor says human being has a value. Human life has a value. Enosh ben Adam. Look at the beautiful Midrash that the next chapters do with this notion. And you see that here. Ma enosh ki tizkereno, uvenadam ki tifkedeno. Chapter 9 and 10 says, God, make sure that no human nation should ever violate the human rights of, another, of other people, of another nation. And he says, God is in heaven, and he checks, he overviews human beings, bnei adam, and he says, There is no respect anymore. There is no value to human beings. They violate each other. They kill each other. And what is the, the closing note of Bnei Adam? Hashem in heaven. God in heaven watches down to earth. What does he want to see? He wants to see, is there a human being out there? Is there a human being who is asking for Hashem? God in search of man. That is exactly the dignity which comes out from chapter 8. Human dignity is great. That is the center of our creation. But we are surrounded by, by Rishaim. So let's uplift the human dignity, and let's try to overcome the Resha. Here is another example which is just outstanding. There is a notion in our chapter which is, which is Tamshileu b'maseya decha kol shata tachat raglecha. Hashem, you gave the human being a lot of uh, power. Uh, you have made him the master over your handiwork laying the world at his feet. To lay the world at his feet, the word shata begins in chapter three. I'm surrounded by enemies who are terribly again, who are terrible against me. And afterwards, Hashem bring them a teacher, bring them respect. Shita Adonai Moralahem, ki hashatot yaharesun. There is just no word, no way to translate the same notion, shata, which is here repeated six times in this unit, and it is so meaningful how it is repeated. Interesting enough that in chapter uh, in chapter twelve it says, "Ata akum yomar Hashem." Now I will get up, he says, and I will uh, help the world. I will bring a Yeshua to the world. That is a quotation of Sefer Yeshayahu. So I hope you will not fire me for having presented this uh, slide. And I will hope, I hope that you will enjoy to read it. It's a lot of work to read it. It was much, it is a lot of work to present it. But here we can see, I hope you can get a taste by reading quickly chapter seven, three to chapter 14. And you will see that in the middle of an evil world, of a terrible world, a lot of Rashaim, the Meshorel says, the Psalmist says, I believe in the creation of God. And I believe that it, there is a dignity. There is a nice story about the Rebbe Mikotsk when he saw once in his backyard the beautiful, uh, a lot of dirt and, and dust and uh, junk and mess. 
and he said, Hashem, you created a wonderful world. Look at all this garbage here. I think that is exactly the message. Uh, chapter eight, 8 says, what a wonderful world, but surrounded how many enemies and destruction. If we understand, and we come to the end of this first lecture, if we understand now that this first unit from 3 to 14, which has a center in 8, is clearly surrounded by an internal frame from the end of 7 to the beginning of 9-10, has also an external frame. It has also a very internal frame within chapter 7. We have a symmetric structure. What does the symmetry tell us or the concentric structure? It says, oh, it's terrible out there, but never forget human dignity and God's greatness on heaven and earth, but at the end on earth. Because at the end it says, God from heaven, he watches down, he wants to see a tzaddik on earth. That is the turning point. That is the first unit. How do we deal, how do we survive in a world of resha, in a world of uh, evildoers? We survive by never ever forgetting our dignity from Hashem and our job to be his shlichim, his messengers of, on earth. That will be continued in the next unit, which I will not open now, but I want you to pay attention. At the end of chapter 14, uh, in chapter 14, at the end of the first unit, it says, At the beginning of chapter, of the second unit, from chapter 15 to 24, it starts, oh, who is the righteous? Who lives without blame? Who does what is right? Poel Tzedek is an answer of no, not Poalei Aven. I want a Tzedek. That is the Poel Tzedek. The two adjacent Mizmorim, uh, 14 and 15, they open a new chapter. God is disappointed and frustrated that nobody is on earth who does righteousness. Wonderful. This chapter opens a new chapter. Where are the good people? We will learn about that in the next lecture, but please pay attention that Poalei Avin, Bedor Tzadik, is exactly continued in chapter 15. So the next lecture, and I will update this uh, uh, schedule, the next two lectures will deal with the second cycle from 15 to 24. If you have time, please read 15 and 24, find the difference, what is in common, and we will elaborate the, third, the, the uh, second unit in the next two lectures, Bezrat Hashem. What I tried to explain is a summary, here the summary, I tried to show the beauty of Mismo 8. I tried to, uh, to experience the, the beauty of the world of Mismo uh, Chet, the eighth chapter. Looking at Mizmor Chet, we saw difficulties to understand, and we spoke about Leman Mipi Olelim Veyonkim Yisadat Oz Leman Tzorerecha Lahashbit Oyev Umitnakem. I do think that this difficulty can only be resolved honestly if we look at the context of three to fourteen and the beautiful world of twelve chapters of a narrative opens. If we look at that as a story of the first unit, which is, of course, the beginning of the first book, which will be continued in the next Mismo. I have here a lot of references, which you will find online. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to uh, hear your comments and questions in the last, in the remaining minutes, please. Hey, thank you, Rabbi Benny. While uh, anybody wants to pass, um, put in any questions or, or speak up, uh, just uh, a reminder, tomorrow night, Rab Rabbi Silver continues his three-part series on Hoshana tomorrow night. And Thursday morning, uh, Rabbi Amnon Bazak Bivrit at 1.30 on, on Sukkot Bimikra, I guess that's afternoon. And Thursday evening at 8.30, I will be giving a shear on Sukkot. So uh, that we have until as we head towards the holiday of Sukkot. And uh, thank you, Rabbi Benny, Rabbi Dr. Benny. And um, I don't see really too many questions in the chat box. People just want to print. But if anybody wants to ask or... or what, is the, what is the significance of the MIPI? 
Olimim Yokim, out of the mouths of the babes and so on. Thank you for this question. Mipi, Mipi, if I say at the end, Ode uh, Hashem, and I will speak out for Hashem, and I will think, I will thank, and I will sing, Azamra, the Ismacha, it's a work, work of my mouth. So the baby, yeah, the baby is crying. The baby is not saying a word. But actually, what the Mizmo wants to say, once they will grow, up and will get older. So the mouth of the child will be part of your shevach v'hoda'ah. Mipi olelim v'yonkim. There is a beautiful midrash which I think meets, fits very, very well. If it says that Mashiach comes and you should go and build the Beit HaMikdash, but I'm just teaching a class of little children in the Chedo. The midrash, it's a halacha, it's a halacha in the Shulchan Aruch, says no. Don't leave the children in the Beit Midrash, even not in the Cheder, because they are now learning and they are now saying the Divrei Torah. Uh, Stay home if a children talks. Mibhevel pihem shel Beit Rabban. The Mashiach can wait and, the, uh, and building the temple can wait. If the child learns, don't run away. That is, of course, a classical midrash of the rabbinical sages. Learning is more important than anything else, but I think it fits very well your, your, your uh, question. If a child speaks out, that is holy. It's the future of the world. It will make sure that the world will not destroy it, what he learns now. A beautiful, I think, explanation from this Midrash Chazal for the meaning, the very, very much the meaning, if a child speaks, why do I know he speaks? Because in chapter nine, I will speak. Thank you. I think that it's interesting that Yon Kim and Nakeim have the same root. It's a word play there. Beautiful. So I think that's a nice comment. The Yonakim will answer the Mitnakim. Right. They will respond. That's exactly what it says in the Mismo. Now, I'm, I, that was not coordinated with you, but I just wanted to emphasize at the beginning, if we don't read Hebrew, we will miss that. So thank you very much. That was exactly hey, what I... Nice to meet you, Benny. Pleasure. So I will try to answer your emails. I cannot reply to all of them, but there are a lot of uh, uh, there were a lot of comments about uh, about the translation. And next time, I intend to talk about learning from non-Jewish Torah, which will be only a short opening remark. But in Yitz Hashem, uh, I'm happy to hear comments, and will try my best to answer. The other thing I wanted to ask you is that you don't you ignore the fact that this, that, that these Mizmarim that you are referring to are about Avshalom. Could he be the, so we're talking about an internal enemy rather than an external enemy. Yes. So that is actually a very important question. Why does chapter three start with Avshalom? We have 13 biographical notes in Sefer Tehillim. When he ran away from Shaul and many when he was hiding in a little cave, we have, when after Chet Batsheva, why do we start with this one? Because the most traumatic experience of King David was when he had to run away from his city, from his Yerushalayim, and he had to run away because his son was his enemy. The worst situation one can imagine. So talking in later generations about the experience of King David, one of the most traumatic experience he had is he had to run away from, because of his son, the worst situation of having an enemy, your own son. He had to leave Yerushalayim, which was the heart of King David, to build Yerushalayim. That is the worst experience of enemies. That is the opening of the first unit. Yeah. Do you think that the ascription to, of the Mizmarim to, for example, Avshalom, and we have Avimelech and all sorts of ascriptions like that. Do you think that they are later ascriptions and therefore they can to, to some be, be ignored 
if we're trying to interpret the original sense of the, of the Sefer? So that is a very critical question. It is by far too important to address it in the last two minutes. And uh, we will talk about that. There are 13 Mismorim, eight of them in the second book. There are 13 Mismorim with the biographical note, eight of them in the second book, four in the first book, and one in chapter 143. Mm -hmm. And we have to, uh, uh, 142. And we have to understand why. What's the narrative according to the, to the, to these biographical notes? If you send me an email, I will send you uh, 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 references on that, and I will be happy to discuss it, the COVID Roche, in one of the next lectures. Of course. Okay, I think uh, Dr. Benny will we'll let you go. We'll let everybody go and uh, look forward to learning with you, um, everybody, next week and other opportunities for learning. And again, want to wish everybody a wonderful year that our filots for Yom Kippur should be answered, Litova, for 